Uh, tonight we are hosting the final program in our three-part series on the Great Molasses Flood. For those of you who have attended the programs, uh, the earlier programs in the series, it will be a similar format. Uh, for any of you who are joining us for the first time, um, the format for the program is that we will start with a brief discussion about the history of the molasses flood, uh, focusing on a specific subject, in this case, the history of immigration, uh, and then we will look at other discussions of immigration in Boston over time. So the program is not exclusively about the molasses flood, it is about starts with the molasses flood and immigration and then goes on following immigration uh, throughout Boston. Um, our discussion tonight will be moderated by the Mass Historical Society's own uh, Peter Drummy. Peter Drummy is the Stephen T. Riley Librarian um, and is also a fantastic resource on Boston history for anyone who is interested. Uh, before turning it over to Peter, I would uh, like to thank our partners uh, in this series. Um, the Old South Meeting House, um, we have worked with them throughout the whole process, uh, and Mass Humanities, whose support, whose support has made the series possible. So without further ado, I'll turn you over to Peter Drummy. Thank you, Gavin. My plan this evening is just to introduce our speakers and then I'm going to, and I'm going to introduce them in the order they'll speak. They're, I'm going to then turn the program over to Steve Puglio who will give us just a brief reminder and outline of the event of January 15th, 1919 itself and then go on and talk about the Italian immigrant community in the um, North End at that time and the effect of this uh, catastrophe upon them. And then um, we'll, um, Jim Vrabel and then Marilyn Johnson will speak about, um, put this into a broader context and bring this up um, closer to the present. Um, whether Mark Twain ever said, history does not repeat itself, but it rhymes, we do see in Boston history periods of rapid growth in the foreign-born percentage of the population of Boston and the region, and to a lesser extent in the country, followed by periods of relative stability or decline in the scale of immigration. Can the history of past eras of large-scale immigration guide us in uh, a like period today? Or make us aware of what we have historically got wrong or got, gotten right? Um, I have the great privilege of introducing three experts who will set the stage in their opening remarks for a conversation among themselves with time at the end for questions from the floor. Stephen Puglio. Steve Puglio is an award-winning newspaper reporter who has worked in corporate communications and public relations as a teacher and popular lecturer, but I suspect he is well known to this audience for what is now getting to be close to being a, sh a shelf full of remarkable nonfiction books on local, regional, and national history, including The Caning, an account of the attack on Senator Charles Sumner on the floor of the Senate in 1854, but really the story of forces at work in the country that pushed us toward civil war. Perhaps it's an omen that a portrait of Charles Sumner looks down upon us from the back of this room this evening. And most recently, American Treasures, um, published in 2016, a gripping account of the secret effort to protect the nation's foundational documents. Tonight, however, I would be remiss if I did not call your attention or to remind you of three books that cover or place in context our topic this evening. The Boston Italians, covering the period between the great immigration from Italy to the present, a city so grand, Boston between 1850 and 1900, and Dark Tide, Steve's definitive account of the great molasses flood of 1919. Dark Tide was first published in 2003 and has been re-released to mark the centennial of the events covered in it. James Vrabel. Jim Vrabel is a historian and community activist who attended Northeastern University and worked for many years, and he may have thought it was many, many years, for the Boston Redevelopment Authority <laughs> as a senior research analyst and editor. He is the author or co-author of books on Pope John Paul II, The Poetry of John Berryman, and perhaps closer to home, and most recently, A People's History of the New Boston, an account of, really a celebration of, the role of neighborhood activists and the rise of the New Boston. But for the purposes of our discussion this evening, Jim wrote the book, 
the indispensable timeline and almanac of Boston history, every librarian's uh, friend, when in Boston, first published in 2004. If you work in the historical line of country or at your neighborhood bar or barbershop, if arguments about Boston history break out, this is the book that should be an arm's length of you. <laughs> Marilyn Johnson. Marilyn Johnson is a professor of history at Boston College where she teaches courses on urban immigration and social history and the history of the American West. Professor Johnson attended Stanford and received her PhD from New York University. While the subjects of her publications are extremely wide ranging, including the Johnson County War, the Range War in the Wyoming Territory in the 1890s, tonight I bring to your attention two of her recent publications, What's New About the New Immigration, a series of essays that she co-edited for the MHS, published in 2014, that includes her essay, The Metropolitan Diaspora, <coughs> New Immigration in Greater Boston, and her The New Bostonians, How Immigrants Have Transformed the Metro Area Since the 1960s, published in 2015. And her latest accomplishment, Global Boston, a fascinating website that serves as a portal to the region's immigrant past and present. Now I'm going to turn um, the program over to Steve Puglio to give us just the briefest outline of the events of January 15th, 1919 in the north end of Boston, and then tell us a little more about the Italian immigrant community that both witnessed and fell victim of this man-made disaster. Steve? Thanks, Peter. And Peter has me on a uh, stopwatch, so I have to move quickly, but I wanted to just start by thanking you folks for turning out tonight. I really, really appreciate the size of the crowd. Uh, you have plenty of other things you could be doing, so thanks very much for being here. I think it'll be a fun program. The past two programs have been a lot of fun. Um, great questions from you guys. It's always my favorite part of this, this um, presentation, so please, when we get to the questions, please don't be shy, so thanks for that. Uh, I'll start quickly and I'll start with the lead, as we used to say in the newspaper business, January 15th, 1919. At just after noontime, a huge steel tank on Boston's Commercial Street waterfront, and when I say huge, 50 feet tall, 90 feet in diameter, filled with 2.3 million gallons of molasses, uh, gives way, disintegrates, uh, collapses, use whatever word you use, but don't use explodes because in the court case that follows, the defense uh, was arguing that a bomb went off and the defense lost this case, uh, the huge court case that follows, in a big way. So it collapses and sends um, a deluge of molasses down Commercial Street, cuts up about a one-mile swath of destruction, destroys buildings, destroys animals, horses, picks up people, um, debris, severs the main overhead train trestle from South Station to North Station, passenger train trestle that ran in the North End at the time, and most people wish we had today, but we don't. <laughs> uh, but it was there, and it was rebuilt afterwards, and stayed until about the Second World War. Um, but really, you need to think of this wave of molasses as almost a small tidal wave. It recoils off the backside of Copps Hill. For those of you who know that topography, Copps Hill slopes down towards the harbor, actually ends up probably protecting hundreds of e or even thousands of people. If Copps Hill sloped the other way, uh, the molasses would have gone into the heart of the neighborhood and the flood would have destroyed many more people and meant much more property. Um, but think about about a mile from the site all the way down southward on Commercial Street all the way almost to Battery Wharf is completely destroyed. And that includes the North End Paving Yard, which is like a DPW yard with a carpentry shop and a blacksmith shop. Um, there's a firehouse, which is on the cover of Dark Tide, about 80 feet from the tank, that uh, gets knocked off of its foundation, traps people underneath. Um, and there's really massive destruction. There are 21 people killed in the flood, 150 people injured, many of them very, very seriously um, you know, broken backs and broken pelvises and fractured skulls and those kinds of things, very, very serious injuries. They're hit by debris, they're hit by the force of the wave itself. Uh, the wave itself comes out at about 35 feet high, 
uh, about 35 miles per hour. Now the phrase, you're as slow as cold molasses in January, does come from this flood story, but that molasses comes out very, very fast. It levels off to about a 20 foot high wave and about 160 feet wide and kind of cuts that swath of destruction. Uh, there is massive cleanup afterwards that we can kind of, I think, talk about as things unfold and maybe during questions. And one of the largest civil lawsuits uh, still in Massachusetts history where 119 plaintiffs go up against one of the large industrial alcohol users in the United States, a private company with the United States in its name, United States Industrial Alcohol. That molasses is the raw material that's used in industrial alcohol, which in peacetime, think of things like dyes and turpentines and paint thinners, things like that. But during the First World War, molasses was the raw material that was processed into industrial alcohol and then further processed and used in the production of munitions for the First World War, nitroglycerin, TNT. So molasses was a protected and very vibrant and busy war industry. For the purposes, I think, of the discussion tonight, which is the immigration discussion, really kind of a fascinating piece of this story, and I think one of the big issues that touches this flood story directly, there are others, the anarchist movement, uh, the way big business and government and the public interact, uh, the whole World War I and munitions production industry all touch this story, but for the immigration purposes, I think in, in the North End at the time, it's both a matter of demographics uh, and kind of overcrowding. So you had a North End neighborhood that's about a square mile of inhabitable space. Those of you who, I, I, I've talked to some people who live in the North End, for those of you, who, the North End has not changed all that much in terms of its physical shape except for those previously rat infested warehouse, warehouses on, um, on the wharf are now overly expensive condominiums, right? <laughs> So we're talking, if you took those warehouses out of the equation, we're talking about a one mile of inhabitable space with about 40,000 people at the time in 1919. Um, maybe the most congested neighborhood in the United States, maybe one of the most congested neighborhoods in the entire world. One historian, not me, said it rivaled Calcutta, in, uh, India in terms of the density of population. And at this time, there are about, of these 40,000 people, 38, 39,000, 98 percent of them are of Italian heritage. Most of the Irish have moved out by this time. Most of the Jewish population has moved out, tiny pockets of each. Um, but the Italians who start coming in great numbers, I would say in 1890, if you think of the great Italian immigration, it's 1890 to about 1910, call it right up to the First World War, 1914 when immigration slows to a trickle at that point. So the North End is almost entirely Italian. But by 1919, still, still about 60% of this neighborhood are not citizens. So they could not vote, and they had very little to say about what went on in their own neighborhood. It takes Italians in general um, a long time to become citizens. My paternal grandfather came in 1906 and became a citizen in 1931. It's pretty much a typical quintessential Italian story. He, you know, he had 10 children while he was here. He's clearly staying and raising a family and working, but doesn't become a citizen till quite late. Lots of distrust of government among Italians, et cetera, um, that, that a part of that cause of that delay in citizenship. But because there weren't a lot of citizens, because the majority of the neighborhood wasn't citizens, they had very little to say about what went on there. So when the tank is sighted, right on the outskirts of the neighborhood. There's barely a whimper, I would say, from the neighborhood itself, from the Boston political hierarchy, um, or from anyone in any kind of authority. And when the tank link, link, leaks from day one, 50-foot uh, long leaks from the top of the tank all the way down to the bottom, there's barely a whimper from the neighborhood or from any of the Boston political hierarchy. And even after the disaster, there's a couple of days of outrage uh, Mayor Andrew Peters, Honey Fitz, who's the congressman at that point still um, in the North End, you know, have a little bit of outrage, but not very much. There's very, very little in that way. So when you think of this kind of a project, this kind of a, a construction project, this kind of material that's captured with, encapsulated within this tank, 
Um, don't be thinking it's like today where there would be you know, hearing after hearing after hearing and neighborhoods and abutters being reached out to and boards of appeals that you needed to go to, et cetera. Um, no such thing. This tank was sited quickly, built quickly, built in a very shoddy fashion, and the immigrants in the neighborhood have had very little to say about it. So that's my intro. Was that quick enough, Peter? Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks. Um, Jim, um, there's in the, uh, at the uh, Global Boston web website, there's a wonderful graphic depiction of the percentage of foreign born within the Boston population over time. And there are three kind of places where the number is very large. This is a graph that covers the period 1850 when, really when good records begin, up to 2015. So in 1850, the percentage is very high, almost as high as it's historically ever been because of the very rapid and very large Irish immigration at the time and after the famine. Then again, right at this point um, in 1919, right before it, in 1910, the foreign-born population of Boston reaches its historical high, more than a third, 36%. And then, relatively recently, in 2015, that um, foreign-born population of Boston is measured at 28%. So where does this, where does this immigrant story in 1919 fit into a wider story of Boston and immigration? Well, um, good question. Um, I think it shows that Boston, like other eastern uh, cities in the United States, was a destination at, at different periods, and that uh, there was a great effect on the city. Um, cities, the cities weren't built to handle th these waves of immigrants, and it was a dirty, dangerous place for immigrants and other residents. Uh, you talked about the 1849, um, there was a, an, a cholera epidemic at Fort Hill that wiped out 500 people, most of them Irish, who had a life expectancy at the time of 14 years. Uh, and in fact, the city report at the time said, uh, there's a density of population unsurpassed in the civilized world. So very similar to what Steve just described in the North End. And immigrants and other residents faced all kinds of uh, dangers from lack of sanitation, enforcement of housing codes, uh, accidents, and disease. Um, in, 19, in 1897, when they were building the first subway in the United States, the gas explosion at the corner of Boylston and Tremont killed 10 people, injured 50 more. Uh, in 1908, the great Chelsea fire across the harbor, 50 people died, 17,000 people homeless. Uh, 1913, the Arcadia Lodging House fire in the South End uh, killed 13 people, injured 28 people. Uh, in 1916, the Summer Street streetcar disaster, a streetcar plunged into Fort Point Channel, drowning 46 people. Uh, the uh, collapse of the Hotel Dreyfus in 1925 killed 44 people. It was a dangerous place. Uh, the city was not prepared for it. Uh, the infrastructure was not prepared for it. The housing codes were not prepared for it. Uh, and when Steve writes about the after effect of the molasses flood, he talks about the growing uh, political involvement of residents who up until that time were kind of wary of government from where they'd come and from where they had gone to. But they did uh, decide to get involved politically, and they had the advantage of it being an overwhelmingly Italian ethnic neighborhood. So there was one big, um, what do we call it now, identity politics. There was a block, and they uh, were able to empower themselves and to spawn leaders, uh, and Steve writes about them in, in his other books as well, Dominic D'Alessandro, uh, who uh, championed labor laws, uh, Joseph Donamora, a publisher, uh, George Siliano, uh, Joe, uh, Joe Langone, 
uh, Gabe Piamonte, pres uh, president of the city council. So the molasses flood and the other conditions they faced ended up uh, pushing them into political involvement, whether they liked it or not. Um, this came in handy uh, because as the city decided to try and deal with the hordes of immigrants and the other poor and working class residents, when they in, uh, got involved in any kind of um, renewal projects, they targeted neighborhoods of immigrants, but they seemed to target areas where there was a diverse, diverse groups of ig uh, immigrants. We, we like to say diversity is a, a strength, but in some ways it's not. Uh, the North End was united politically, but some of these other neighborhoods weren't. Uh, what did they do at Fort Hill after 500 people died? Well, 10 or 15 years later, they knocked down Fort Hill and they, they dispersed all the residents there. And uh, that's, this is the Fort Hill in downtown Boston, not to be confused with the one in Roxbury. Uh, in Chinatown, which uh, had a large Syrian and Lebanese population, they widened Harrison Ave, they ended up building the central artery. Chinatown was reduced to a small number uh, small, uh, small geographic, much smaller geographic size than it had been previously. South Boston, we think of as being uh, a, uh, a political powerhouse uh, united around Irish Americans. When the city decided it was going to uh, start public housing, they displaced thousands of residents in an area that was both Irish, Polish, and Lithuanian to build the Mary Ellen McCormick housing development, the first federally subsidized housing development in the United States. Um, when they decided to engage in uh, official urban renewal, uh, the first official urban renewal program was in the New York streets area uh, of the South End. Uh, Mel King talks about growing up playing ball with kids named Cohen and Finnegan and Kowalski and uh, Chinese kids. But the city didn't look at that diversity as a strength. In fact, um, there was a, a BHA development report that, that uh, talked about how the neighborhood had uh, abandoned any vestige of pride. Uh, Gloria Gano, who is here tonight in the first row said, and, and lived in the New York streets area, said it wasn't that we didn't have any pride, it's that we weren't that well educated and when they told us to go, we went. That brings us to the kind of quintessential renewal story of an immigrant neighborhood, which is the West End. Uh, on the face of it, the, the West End, uh, the North End could have been chosen instead of the West End for urban renewal. Jim Campano, who grew up in the West End, said that the city was looking for a slum in a good neighborhood. <laughs> uh, and the North End fit the bill just as well as the West End did. In fact, a study of the buildings showed that the West End buildings were in much better shape than the North End. But the West End had a problem. It was diverse. It didn't have that critical mass for political power. And so it was chosen for redevelopment. Um, they did their best. The residents of the West End did their best, but they just didn't have the political clout. Um, they had meetings, they had protests, they had marches, lawsuits. They tried to stop the city from this renewal that was a renewal, a physical renewal, but it certainly wasn't a human renewal. Uh, and they lost. And because of that, the West End is no more. I, cons I consider there were two other reasons that the West End was demolished, that we lost the West End. One was that the West End hadn't happened yet. The demolition of the West End hadn't happened yet. We hadn't seen uh, what government can do when it engages in some kind of wrong-headed attempts at renewal. Uh, the West End was a lesson. Langley Keyes says that it was a warning to that you better watch out because they're coming for you. And they could be the T or the Port Authority or the city or whomever, and you better watch out. And because the West End the diverse West End, uh, as opposed to the more uh, solidly Italian North End, was demolished, um, and they fought and lost. That lesson was passed on to other neighborhoods, both uh, more heterogeneous neighborhoods more hom and homogeneous ethnic neighborhoods, that they did, did have to be on guard. The other reason I think that the West End was lost was that the 60s hadn't happened. 
and the political activism of the 60s hadn't happened yet. Uh, Mel King says that uh, for a group um, to be politically active, it has to get a sense of its own dignity and worth and being deserving of better respect, of being treated with respect. Um, early on, immigrant groups were able to get that sense of dignity and, and worth. Uh, in the 60s, the lesson was that you could get that sense of dignity and worth in other ways, and that you didn't have to just uh, fight for your own ethnic group, that you could form coalitions with other ethnic groups, and that diverse neighborhoods or neighborhoods solidly ethnic could join with other solidly ethnic groups. And that's why the, the fight against urban renewal, they were able to temper some of the excesses of urban renewal, they were able to fight for better public housing, uh, for more affordable housing, for things like rent control. They were able to stop highways from being built that would have split neighborhood from neighborhood, split neighborhoods within neighborhoods. Uh, they were able to fight for Boston jobs for Boston residents, a lot of them immigrants. And, and they were able, the new Boston was a, a better city because of the organizing of people in these poor and working class neighborhoods immigrant neighborhoods uh, to fight for their own rights and to stop the excesses of the city. I think today the challenge is for new immigrants in Boston to fight with the grandchildren of any of the grandchildren, the sons and daughters, of the grand grandsons and granddaughters of those immigrants 100 years ago to see if they can fight for a place in today's city because it's uh, certainly a, a hard place to remain. and, and it's a hard place to come into, and it's a hard place to stay. And that's the, that's the kind of immigrant story of today, I think. Uh, Lynn, in thinking about the new immigrants to Boston, this extraordinary story, um, I was struck by coincidence, I was looking at the first report of the North End Dispensary, which was founded in 1870. In 1870, North End Dispensary has, um, counting the, um, uh, ethnicity of its patients, it has one Italian patient. So that in 50 years, you have a neighborhood that goes from having a single outlier to ha be 98% Italian. I think our idea that, um, Jim has made this point, but our idea of um, neighborhoods being fixed or uh, ethnically um, homogenous um, is perhaps not historically what we've seen, but my suspicion is even less so today. Uh, yeah, Peter, that's true. And um, that's for, for a number of reasons. I, uh, one of them is that there's you know, constant change going on in terms of the immigrants who are coming in and where they're living and how those neighborhoods are constantly uh, turning over, the churning of population. Um, also because of the sheer diversity of immigrants who have been coming since 1965 and the passage of the Immigration and Nationality Act, which changed our immigration system and, and got rid of the old quota system and opened it up to immigrants from uh, around the world in uh, greater numbers than they've been able to get in before. Um, and I think the other thing that, that happened is some of the traditional old immigrant quarters, the North End, the West End, the South End, um, experienced uh, this urban renewal that um, uh, Jim has talked about and uh, a lot of gentrification that have made them unaffordable to new immigrants. So now immigrant communities are in outlying neighborhoods, places like Roxbury, Dorchester, Mattapan, East Boston, Alston Brighton, um, and increasingly out in the suburbs, uh, some of the old industrial suburbs to the north of the city, as well as more affluent um, suburbs out uh, to the west and south. Um, I wanted to talk about the, the ongoing impact of industry and environmental degradation on immigrant communities, which is an old story. We certainly saw it in the North End in 1919, um, but it, it preceded that and it has continued up to the present day. And Jim gave some examples of that, um, and I would add to that the um, 
the thinking about industries that have really had a, a negative impact on communities where immigrants lived. Uh, we had a very large, back in the 19th century, we had a very large meatpacking and slaughterhouse industry here in the Boston area in uh, the Cambridge-Somerville line and also in um, Brighton. And these were areas where a lot of Irish and Italian and Portuguese immigrants lived and the pollution from those, uh, from those facilities um, was really uh, awful and poisoned the water and, and the land for many years to come. And um, another example would be uh, the development of the airport in East Boston when it was up in the 20th century, it was predominantly Italian-American community. The noise and the air pollution that, that came from, from the airport uh, had a disproportionate effect on uh, those folks. And uh, Jim mentioned the, uh, the fires in Chelsea. Um, these were torrential kind of oil-fed fires because of all the um, oil that was stored uh, there and the, and the industries uh, that were packed together in Chelsea. Uh, two different fires, the 1908 fire, which leveled the part of the city when it was a predominantly Jewish-American uh, community in 1908. And then again in 1973, when it was on its way, Chelsea was on its way to becoming a predominantly Latino Central American community. And that's just to name, name a few examples from the past. But I think what we've seen recently is as in the, you know, in the era after World War II, as Boston has become less of an industrial city and more of a post-industrial service center, um, that means that many of today's threats are less about current industrial disasters and more about um, the aftermath of what those industries left behind in the area. And when they, particularly when after they pulled up stakes in the 1970s and 80s and moved to the south or to the global south and left behind uh, this industrial landscape that wasn't very well cleaned up. Um, also, the collapse of the tax base that ensued in many older industrial communities led to further decay um, of that urban infrastructure that has caused more problems for those same uh, low income and immigrant and uh, communities and communities of color. So some of the biggest hazards in today's poor immigrant communities and communities of color are the toxic soil and buildings and water supplies that are left behind, the gas explosions that we saw in Lawrence, for instance, uh, last year. The year before, if we go a little further afield, remember what happened with the water supply in Flint, Michigan, uh, and that was reminiscent of something that had happened earlier here in the Boston area in Woburn back in the 1980s. If anybody saw civil action with John Travolta, uh, you know that the, the whole water system there was poisoned by um, industrial solvents that uh, got into the uh, the wells there. So this has been going on for for quite a while. And um, Massachusetts and surrounding states have more than their share of these problems because we had more than our share of industry in the past. And there are today more than 3,000 brownfield sites in New England alone, and the majority are located in low-income immigrant and black and Latino communities. I have a map I want to show you that uh, gives you some sense of this. These are... Uh, these are brownfield sites, um, and just showing the Boston area here, um, you can the red the red dots are the brownfield sites, and the background of the map shows you the income levels. Uh, the lighter the color, the lower the income level. The darker blue the color, the higher the income level. And I think it's it's pretty clear where these brownfield sites are located. And you can see there's a lot of them in the Boston area, and a little bit to the north up in, up in Salem. There's also quite a few up just, uh, just above, to the left of um, uh, Boxford. That's the Lawrence area. And then just to the, to the left of that is Lowell. Uh, down here, you have uh, Rockton. And uh, this is Worcester out here. So a lot of these older mill towns and industrial areas are where these brownfields are located. They are disproportionately low-income areas. They have a lot of immigrants living in them, a lot of people of color, low-income areas. Um, I also wanted to zoom in and show you uh, a little bit more about Boston. Now we can kind of see in Boston, 
Uh, you can see there's a big cluster of sites here. This is Roxbury, this is Dorchester, and this is Mattapan. Um, perhaps not, not all that surprising that the, these uh, brownfield sites are located where they are. These are neighborhoods, predominantly neighborhoods of color. They're neighborhoods with a lot of immigrants uh, who come from areas, uh, countries like the Dominican Rep Republic, Haiti, uh, Cape Verde, uh, Vietnam, and lots of other uh, parts of the world. Um, they are, you'll notice that there aren't as many hazardous sites in, um, in other parts of the city uh, because they've been cleaned up. There was industry um, across many different neighborhoods. But um, in these more prosperous and gentrifying areas of the city, um, it, uh, these sites have been cleaned up because developers are willing to invest in cleaning up those sites uh, in neighborhoods where they can make big profits with development projects. Now, this is much harder to do in poorer neighborhoods like Roxbury and Dorchester, and even harder in the region's mill towns, places like Lowell, Lawrence, Brockton, because the potential for profitable, profitable real estate development isn't there. The margin is much, is much slimmer. And these are the same communities that continue to house large numbers of uh, poorer immigrants of color. But there is some good news. And that is that recently we've seen some successful efforts by local nonprofits working with the EPA to train low income workers to do environmental re remediation work in places like Lawrence is a notable example. And these jobs, once you get the training, they pay reasonably well, at least 50% among the uh, above the $12 minimum wage. They hire local residents. They remove toxic hazards in the community and they make economic development possible in the future because once these sites are cleaned up, then it's, it's less expensive to develop them. Now the funding um, comes from uh, EPA grants, uh, but the money is limited. There are thousands and thousands of these sites across the country and only a few hundred grants a year which are given. And of course these jobs involve um, high risk work. Um, it is, it's, can be bad for your health, right, to work with a lot of toxic substances, although safety standards are and safety equipment is, is getting better. But I would say that for unemployed or underemployed folks who live next to these brownfield sites, um, getting trained and paid to clean them up can be a step forward. And people in uh, the, the community where this, this has happened the most in Massachusetts is in Lawrence. This is, a, this is a, an old mill town, oh, you, uh, uh, woolens and, and textiles were produced there in the early 20th century, and um, now it's 75% Latino, predominantly uh, Dominicans, Dominican Americans, and um, they have one of the most successful programs for economic, uh, for environmental remediation. And um, they actually remind me of the Italian residents of the North End who, uh, in the wake of the molasses disaster, fought for legislation, state legislation, to have gas storage tanks removed uh, from residential neighborhoods. And that legislation was passed in the 1920s, and it became a model for state legislation around the country. And at least half a dozen other states used similar legislation to get these big tanks uh, out of residential neighborhoods. And in the North End, as in Lawrence today, those efforts have resulted in jobs for local workers, removing environmental hazards in their neighborhoods, and turning those sites into parks and housing and, and businesses. So I th do think there's a, a promising uh, solution here, but it's really just a, a, almost a pilot project. It needs to be um, really expanded um, in terms of um, matching up these, uh, the, the cleanup of these sites with the people who live there and, and, and need the jobs and need, and need the job training. I want to give um, a, a shout out here to a couple of people uh, because I've, I've learned a lot from these two graduate students. One of them is Story Hinckley, who's a grad student at Northeastern School of Journalism, who made this map and, and wrote about Lawrence, did a terrific job. And also Kelly Lyons, who's a PhD student in history at Boston College, who researched and wrote about the tanks and, and the campaign to get the tanks out of the North End. I have URLs for both of their stories. They're very interesting. Uh, if you'd like to know more about it, happy to give those uh, sites to you after, after the talk.
Thanks. I'm just going to um, open the, our discussion with a, a, um, a question or two for our panelists to see if they all can weigh in on um, things. And then we're going to invite you, um, um, uh, your questions from the floor. And when we turn to those, we'll sort of explain how we're going to do that. But I was thinking, uh, uh, Steve, um, one of the things that sort of strikes me when you read about the Italian community in the North End at the time of the molasses flood, that you, as you describe it, you have this conservative um, community in terms of change, often people who have associations with the same places in Italy that have come from. Mm -hmm. At the same time, strikingly, you have a strong anarchist movement, um, perhaps not on a giant scale, but, but nevertheless, you have a radical movement underway at the same time. We think forward a little bit in time, and um, Sacco and Vanzetti come out of this um, um, anarchist movement here. Um, the, but, there, but Steve has a wonderful example, the anarchist mu movement here. They, they had uh, 3,000 subscribers to their journal, which was titled The, Sub the Subversive Journal, telling you where they stood. Um, but I, but um, at different times, people's reaction, the, that kind of uh, political agitation or um, among uh, immigrant groups has been different at different times. And I wonder if you could talk about how, maybe the reasons why there's those differences, both who the immigrants are and the, um, the circumstance of um, uh, the time that they lived and how they thought about this. Yeah, so I guess on the, the, for the Italian immigrant community, <clears throat> and Peter's right, so Italians, one of the ironic things about Italian immigration is that Italians don't really have an identity as Italians until they come to America, right? They are Calabrians or Villanese or Sicilians or Genoese, whatever, um, but they very much identify with the region from which they come to from in Italy. And one of the reasons for that is, of course, Italy's not unified until 1860. So think about that if you put your timeline hat on. Italy's not unified as a single country until around the American Civil War. Before that, it's the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies, it's the Papal State, it's the North, the Bourbons. You know, it's all kind of mixed up uh, until Garibaldi unifies the country in 1860. And when it does get unified, there is great prejudice and great discrimination on behalf of the Romans and the Northerners upon the Southerners. And that includes every, you know, if you draw a line at Rome and go south, including Sicily, right? That's what I mean when I say the Southerners. Um, to the point where, you know, usurious taxes are placed on, on top of these folks. Um, the Catholic Church priests don't even want to give communion to a lot of Southern Italians because they don't really consider them Italians and part of the country. And of course, about 80% of the immigrants to the United States are from where? The South, right? So part of that, they transplant their, their paese, right, to the places that they, um, that they immigrate to. And that includes every major city in the United States and even small neighborhoods like the North End. So these three or four streets over here would be Calabrians only. These three or four streets over here would be Sicilians only, right? I mean, any of you who have any uh, Italian heritage know that if you went to St. Leonard's Church, you could not be caught dead at Sacred Heart Church, which is about 45 seconds away, a quick, quick rock, walk, right? But it was all according to where you, you came from. And so this kind of, Jim's right that it eventually Italians do get to be a pretty strong voting bloc, but it's not until into the 30s, in really all the way up, really to about the Second World War. In the early days, they're split because of that. Um, and they, what do they do when they come here? And their goal is to mainly work hard and own homes. They're not big on education, formal education. It takes Italians a long time to recognize the value of that. They're very big on home ownership um, because that's really important to them. That's a way of them having permanence, a way of them having something they never had in the old country, right? So they're not overly politically active in these early days, with the exception of a small minority 
and Peter's right, these are the anarchists movement. So the anarchist movement, I'd say, is pretty violent and pretty um, active, and that's anarchists of, of a lot of different nationalities, but yeah, the Italian anarchist movement really has as its de facto national headquarters, Boston's North End. And these are the comrades of Sacco and Benzetti. Um, there are munitions plants that are blown up around the area by anarchists. Um, there's a police station on Salutation Street in the North End blown up in 1916. Um, right after the molasses flood in April of 1919, anarchists send package bombs through the mail to about 35 government officials and business officials. Most of them are intercepted. And in June of 1919, think about this, just five months after the molasses flood, anarchists explode seven bombs simultaneously in cities around the country, including Washington, D.C., at the Attorney General's of the United States House, right? Mitchell Palmer, who was responsible for some of the Palmer raids. So really an active time by a very small minority group. And even when the molasses flood uh, case is beginning. The court case begins in September of 1920. Uh, Charles Choate, who's the, who's the lead lawyer for the defense, um, is making this anarchist argument that anarchists dropped a pipe bomb into the tank and it blew up and they, they sh should therefore be absolved of all liability. Well, as he's beginning his open, right, an anarchist bomb goes off in New York City on Wall Street, kills 42 people at lunchtime in front of J.P. Morgan's headquarters. And so it's almost for him a, like a fortunate circumstantial uh, beginning. So you had this strange dichotomy, I think, where most Italians in, those, in that day, not overly politically active, with exceptions, of course, but a very small group who were anarchists and who were active. And finally, the Sacco and Benzetti piece, which I think is important. Um, I am not a big Sacco and Benzetti apologist or romanticist. Um, they are bad guys. I think Sacco is probably guilty. Renzetti is probably innocent in my reading. I think I've read as much of, on this case as you possibly can. Um, but they're violent bad guys. Um, that doesn't mean they got a fair trial. You know, I think you can hold both of those things at the same time. I think they get a, an unfair trial in part because they're uh, anarchists and in part because they're Italian immigrants. The Italian immigrant community in their funeral in 1927 attributes it almost entirely to their Italian heritage, that the way they were treated and the fact that they were not given a fair trial, which is why 250,000 people lined the streets uh, from Del Russo, um, I mean from Langone, sorry, funeral home uh, in the North End, all the way to Forest Hills Cemetery, which is where uh, they were buried. So they became cult heroes uh, I think because of the feeling that they were discriminated against. Uh, two things. One is, if it's hard for Italians from different parts of Italy to organize politically once they come to the United States, imagine how difficult it is for small groups of immigrants from other countries to organize themselves and then to organize with other groups from other countries. And this was, um, the reason that it, it took a while for these immigrant communities and poor and working class communities to get political power. Uh, the Irish had it easy. I mean, it's in their blood. They speak the language. They came over in hundreds of, thou the number, hundreds of thousands, and they took political power relatively soon. But the struggle for other immigrant groups to do the same in Boston was a, a tough road to hoe, and that's why I give so much credit for what went on in the 1960s, uh, where people from different neighborhoods and different ethnic groups and different racial groups were able to build coalitions. Uh, the other thing I'd like to say is, uh, I'd like to quote something um, the late Alan Lupo, who I think is the, the patron saint of neighborhood journalists in Boston, once said um, that uh, he, he, he read a lot but he didn't know why these periods of political activism arose when they did. Why you got the anarchists and the muckrakers in the 1910s and 20s and 30s. Why you got all the political activism in the 60s. And he said he didn't know where it was going to come from next. He thought maybe it would come from the immigrants, the new immigrants, to Boston and to the United States. But if it did, he hoped that they took the other uh, the causes, the common causes 
that they had with other residents into consideration and built coalitions with them. Linda, does that look any different from in this um, recent period? Is is the is the um, uh, status of so many the the legal status of so many people that are here now affect the um, organization and the um, essentially agitation within the modern immigrant community? Yeah, I think there are there are similarities to the. Um, the earlier immigrant wave in the sense that it, it does take a while for immigrants to get involved in the political system. It's typically not the first generation. It's usually the, the second or subsequent generations, those who grow up here and um, learn English from, from, from birth, native speakers, and uh, grow up here and understand the, 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 the political world that they're living in. And that's exactly what we're seeing now. I would say since the late 1990s, early 2000s, we've seen a tremendous um, uh, rise in the number of um, immigrants and particularly children of immigrants who have become involved in, in local and state level politics. Um, it's not enough, but it's in terms of their representation of their numbers, but it is significantly more than we saw in the, in the 20th century. But the issue of documentation, I think, does um, make it more difficult for some communities that have higher, higher numbers of undocumented people who can't become citizens. And it's, it's often difficult to, to get people to decide that they, they want to become citizens even if they can, but if they can't, and particularly in the current climate when so many people are, are living in fear, um, that you know they're going to be deported or whatever. Um, trying to get people registered to vote or even get them to uh, talk to the census taker can be a pretty difficult uh, uh, um, challenge. Um, what we're going to do now is um, a, we have had a full hour almost here, so I'm just going to ask. Um, for people to bear with us for a couple of questions from the audience. And, and what I would like to ask, actually for all three of you, because you've all touched on it, is the reasons why at different times maybe it's easier or harder uh, for people to organize on these things. <clears throat> and I'm wondering if part of the reason might be that at least in the teens through the 20s and 30s, there was a strong and radical union movement here that kind of brought people out of a comfort area of my group, my ethnic group, and said, you know, no, you're a class, and there's something to share there. And whether we might have lost some of that now with so much um, emphasis on identity politics, and not that it's not good to be proud of your heritage and all, but maybe we haven't tempered that as much with you're all a class to work together and have maybe some leadership that arranges that. And I wondered what thoughts anybody has on that. Uh, I, I think that it's a terrific question. Uh, and I think we should all think about what the answer is. Um, one of the things that I would say about it is that um, we are somewhat hesitant in the United States to talk about class. Uh, we are all of the opinion that we should all be able to pull ourselves on up, up, up by our bootstraps and we can all be successes and uh, it's all up to us and we don't like to kind of be pigeonholed and think that there is some kind of structure that's, that's, a way, that, that's over us that's keeping us back. Uh, I think um, Immigrants uh, try to be American. Uh, poor and working class people try to think that they're middle class. And um, it's a kind of a, um, a myth that we should, we should end and we should embrace those things. I, I just think it was a terrific question. Okay. I, I was just, oh, no, go, go ahead. ahead. Oh, okay. go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say that, that I think that is a really important thing that's been lost, right? And that it's, it, it may be coming back a bit these days. It's feeling like the union movement is, uh, is, is showing some, some new life. Um, but uh, I think th the CIO in particular was a, a vehicle for getting a lot of uh, different 
working class people together from different ethnic backgrounds and connecting them with politics, particularly through the Democratic Party. And nowadays we don't have that nearly as much. Instead what we have, at least on the, on the city level, is um, nonprofits that work with immigrants in different communities sort of become the launching pad for immigrants to go into, uh, into political office and, or, or electoral politics more generally. And that's good too, but it also, a lot of those nonprofits are dealing with specific communities that have specific cultural needs and language needs, and that makes a lot of sense for them, but if that becomes your conveyor belt into, into politics, it means that you're gonna do it from a sort of identity politics uh, angle. Um, so if the labor movement were to become stronger and become that vehicle for getting people politically engaged, I think it would be a good thing. Thank you. So I'd like to ask you uh, a two-part question. One is hopefully uh, if perhaps we could deal with the issue of race versus class. Mm -hmm. And I'll make an observation. I grew up in New York, I went to school in Chicago, and then I came here. In Chicago there was, at the time I was there, Cicero Avenue, one side of Cicero Avenue was completely white. The other side of Cicero Avenue was completely black. And one of the things I noticed when I came here was that in addition to, you know, there were clearly were racial, uh, you know, racial parameters there, there were, there were very strong class parameters, particularly in the suburbs. You can't, you don't need to look at the sign that says you're entering this town or that town or whatever. You can just, as you're driving, you can say, I'm now in a different town because, um, class, economic class, is obvious just from, from, from you know, what you're seeing. I was wondering if you could comment on those two. That's you first. Well, suburbs in both neighbor, urban neighborhoods and suburbs in the Boston area do have particular class and racial ethnic uh, attributes to them. And some of them are more uh, homogeneous than others. Um, you have places like Quincy, which is really known for its uh, Chinese and Vietnamese Asian American communities, uh, as sort of a second Chinatown kind of. Um, and then you have other communities like Malden, where it started out that way, but has now become much more diverse and a lot of different communities there. And um, it may be actually harder, as, as Jim talked earlier, to um, be able to pull all those different ethnic groups together and organize them uh, politically. Um, Everett is a town that has a lot of different uh, immigrant groups in it, and it may be one of the reasons that they have a casino now when East Boston was able to, to fight it off with a predominantly Spanish-speaking uh, community there and church leaders who were opposed to it. Um, so you may think a, a, a casino is a, is a good thing, but there are a lot of people who didn't think it was good. So um, I do think we, we have that here in terms of different, you know, certainly we are, our suburbs are, uh, have different class complexions and different um, ethnic racial complexions as well. Yeah, I was just saying, I think that's true, but I don't think it's all that different from most suburban areas, like suburban Chicago, the, some of the biggest uh, suburbs around Chicago have similar kinds of things. You go to certain towns or certain communities and, the, and you say, oh, this is like Hingham, or this is like Cohasset, and then you go to other communities and you say, you know, this is more like a Quincy. Or like, so I, I don't think it's so much different here, um, but yeah, I'm kind of in agreement. Okay, I'm gonna um, ask you all in joining me in thanking our speakers this evening. <laughs>